Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining this working group for optimizing power grids. This is going to be a wonderful discussion that we have prepared for you on aligning incentive regulation with public interest. This is a topic that has attracted a great deal of attention. Um, so very much looking forward to hearing the comments from our speakers and from all of you. This is going to be an interactive discussion. My name is Alex Hodling. I'll be moderating this discussion. I serve on the board of Current and I lead business development for Line Vision. And I'm based in Boston, the US. So if I look a little bit tired, it's because I am. It's a little bit early here, um, but very eager for this discussion. And that's what's keeping me uh, very, very alert and awake. This is, um, this is gonna be great. First, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. This is an incredibly impressive group of, of people with a vast amount of experience. And we're all gonna be able to benefit from that and hearing their comments. Everyone on this call is a professional. We've all done these webinars before, but it takes a lot of time to prepare for this. And each speaker has uh, taken that time to prepare to give you the best possible presentation. So thank you very much for, for taking that time. Really what's been fascinating for me is that, well, from my perspective, it's, it's been in the last 12 months where we've seen great acceleration of this discussion on the role of incentives to drive the behaviors and the market dynamics that I think many of us agree are needed to deliver greater efficiency and optimization of the power grid. And what's interesting to me is that these discussions are happening all over the world. So perhaps we're beginning the week here as, as a group uh, with experts from TSOs, with regulators for industry experts, um, but we're going to globally end the week in Washington, D.C. with a group of utilities, regulators, and industry experts, just like we have here, discussing incentives with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in the U.S. So given the fact that this type of conversation, these very things, although specific regionally, uh, more broadly, um, are, are reaching what I think is a tipping point, and what we're seeing is the process of now deciding how to implement not just whether we should implement. And I think you'll find that our panelists agree um, on the broader themes, but um, how we actually implement that is, is really what we're here to discuss today. So this is of course focused on Europe, but again, what's fascinating is that this is a global discussion and the time for this has, has come. Let me walk through the agenda quickly and then we'll jump right into the content. So I'll soon be introducing uh, Suzanne East who is the current chair and general manager for Germany for Smart Wires Incorporated, which all of you know is a silicon-based uh, global green tech company that optimizes power networks through um, modular load flow control. Suzanne holds a PhD in habituation from Bonn University, Berlin Free University, as well as Sciences Po Paris in political sciences, as well as an economics degree from the London School of Economics. So. Uh, vastly ex exposed to uh, the, uh, the economic drivers of, of this discussion, and we're, uh, we're definitely benefiting from, from Suzanne's expertise. Suzanne will introduce uh, Marcus Berger, who will be delivering our keynote address, um, and then I'll be turning it over one by one to our panelists for, for their comments. We have Nathan uh, Appleman with NSOE, we have um, Michael Berger with Acer, eControl, uh, Ricardo Velati with Aria and Vasiliki Panari with Wind Europe, and then rounding it out with um, Rina uh, Guwahati with, with Current, as well as Impasamon. And then we'll be opening it up for a broader discussion. So we've reserved quite a bit of time for, for this group to have a conversation with each other and including you. So if you do have questions, you can type them into the chat function. And what I would recommend is you have a question for a specific panelist, if you could just note that at the start of your question so we know how to direct that. We will of course do our best to answer all of the questions that are asked, but there are a lot of people on this call. So we, we likely will not be able to get to all of your questions uh, during the call, but we will of course follow up over email uh, with, with every question that's been asked. So even if we're not able to address it, you will have an answer and be able to continue this discussion, which is really the benefit because we're here for 90 minutes, but the topic uh, certainly warrants a broader discussion and we encourage you to, to take that outside of this webinar as well. So quite straightforward, uh, this is gonna be a great discussion. Now I will turn it over to Suzanne to introduce Current and Marcus. Suzanne. 
Thank you very much, Alex, and uh, thanks to all of you to be here today for a very important discussion. Yeah, discussing in the member states, I'm in Berlin, not in Boston, so it's great time. Uh, so we, we, we discuss up and down how regulation has to change to incentivize what is on the shelf, and that's exactly what is on the menu for today, uh, the framework for incentive regulation. So I have a double hat, like many of us that are here, uh, uh, sitting here. So I'm on the one hand, uh, the, the board chair of current. We yeah, are new kids on the block, can still claim that, one year old association representing uh, grid enhancing technology stretching from superconductors to various types of dynamic line, ra line rating to the facts devices, working on TSOs and DSOs, collaborating with Digital Grid Initiative, and uh, sitting um, in the NZWI Technopedia uh, group as well as uh, on the Infrastructure Forum, Florence Forum. So we, we have our say and are appreciating to exchange with you. Um, so why are we doing this uh, all together, this event, and why are we doing what we are doing? This is clearly because climate change is a reality today. Uh, you see on the right side, that's the future of uh, the global future, these kids that uh, rightly claim uh, to keep the planet in good shape. That's our responsibility. And this means electrification, 60% uh, probably or more by 2050 from today, 22% that are, uh, is the share of electricity in the energy system quite low. Uh, and uh, possibly the, the, the other part will be made up by maybe hydrogen, something else, big challenges. And we know that electricity can hardly be stored and therefore networks are central. Those networks are expensive. We talk in Europe about 500 billion to be invested by 2030. In Germany alone, it's 84 to 100 billion euro to be invested on only high voltage transmission. Uh, and we need to make the best out of those long-term investments, 40 years plus, uh, and therefore grid enhancing technologies that go against those high costs on congestion or curtailment are absolutely needed. You also see a third industrial revolution uh, coming here. We see that cities like Frankfurt, Amsterdam, or London become uh, energy war. They use a lot of energy for the data centers that they host. They are hubs themselves. And we will see a distribution, a decentralization of those data centers asking for more and more energy and electricity to be consumed. Commission came just out with an action plan for digitalizing the energy uh, sector, which shows us that um, we are only at the beginning of this digitalization move. Our technologies are on the shelf and we want them to be used now. It's not the case because, for example, the CAPEX heaviness of the regulation, because, for example, uh, a certain delay in using new things is a given. That's why uh, we claim use those technologies now, and we are very keen to hear all of your perspective on how we can progress and act together. So now I'm very happy to introduce uh, our distinguished keynote speaker. Uh, I think most of you know Marcus Berger. Marcus Berger is a member of the executive committee uh, of uh, ILIA. ILIA is one of the leading TSOs being active both in uh, Belgium, but also in Germany with 50 Hertz being part of the ILIA group. And Marcus Berger, that is since five years in ILIA, uh, that has studied in such prestigious universities as INSEAD, Solve, um, and also l'Université Libre de, de Bruxelles, uh, is today the Chief Officer Infrastructure in Elia. So we are very happy, uh, Marcus, uh, to, to get your perspective on the topic of today's webinar. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Suzanne. First of all, your French is quite good, I must say. Um, and before starting on my turn from Brussels, then uh, allow me to welcome everyone who is connected for the discussion of today. And uh, thank you also for this introduction. And for inviting me to participate to the debate uh, of today. When I was looking at the topic of the discussion of today, it was it's quite it's quite large. Uh, what what means as well that there is a necessity, of course, to to align and to find an alignment between quite a lot of different stakeholders 
to implement things and to make them fly. Uh, that's the reason also why you have such different kind of, uh, of, of persons present in the panel. And I hope also that the question will, will be, uh, will be uh, very important and, and, and large also. In fact, last week when I was listening to the DNV uh, energy transition outlook, I heard uh, very ambitious goals and also a lot of to-dos to reach them. And this is certainly also the case in Europe if we want to reach the carbon neutrality in, in, in 2050. Uh, when I'm looking at the Green Deal, for example, and the translation of the Green Deal over the years, all of you knows that we need already by 2030 to reduce our greenhouse gas emission uh, at least by 55%. Or saying it differently, we will need to do in the next nine years what we did in fact the last 30 years. And let's be honest, if we don't reach this goal by reducing this gas emission by 55% in 2030, it will be very difficult, very difficult to reach this carbon neutrality in 2050. So 2030 is, in my opinion, a very important milestone. That being said, which are the main challenges or hurdles that we have to overcome, but also what kind of solution are possible. First of all, I think we need to think in a more open and inclusive way. Uh, it's for me not all nuclear or gas or wind or sun or hydrogen. It's end, 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 end. Uh, therefore, I believe also in this decade, we must first make use of all mature technologies to reduce and smartly use energy while making it cost efficient, for instance, uh, through building renovation. At the same time, I believe also that we need to invest in not yet mature technologies sufficiently and I mean with that renewable uh, hydrogen for hard to abate users, for example, but also floating offshore or even uh, multi-terminal HVDC. Finally, I think also we must accelerate and speed up uh, electrification in end use sectors such as transport via electrical vehicles, uh, heating and cooling, thanks to heat pumps, but also in the industry by, for example, electrifying process in, in, in chemicals. But we have also to increase drastically the, the, the development that we say in that way uh, in offshore, but also in onshore uh, renewable. What does all this now means for uh, transmission system operators specifically? All this, for all this challenge, I think to start, we need to, and have all these needs uh, managed in the right way, we have to take into consideration two very important things in my view, very important. The first one is that in a more electrical world, we need to manage not only the intermittency of renewable, but also a higher, I would call it dependency of the global economy on the electrical uh, power system. I can't imagine the consequences, for example, for long duration uh, blackout in Europe. This is the first element. The second one is to deliver on time, we need also not only access to financing, but also faster permitting and broader support and now I'm talking really as a TSO, and broader support from authorities and public to manage what I call the NIMBY effect. I know in the past some efforts were done on that topic, uh, more specifically on the European level with the one-stop shop for the project of common interest at European level. But to be honest, it didn't really help the TSO till now. 
So a lot of people are aware that important great investments are needed to enable this rapid decarbonization. And together with more classical solution, we will need uh, to be sex su successful, sorry, to, uh, to find also novel solution. This is the case, for instance, for uh, the development of onshore, but also for offshore grid in the next year to channel all the renewables that we have on the offshore side and who are often located far from the demand and the consumption centers. So consumer can enjoy, I would say, high availability of service and greener energy and these at competitive uh, prices. In Belgium, for example, I heard Suzanne said that in the next year we will have to invest, I suppose it was uh, in Europe, 500 billion of euro. Now, at the smaller scale, when I'm looking at area and only for Belgium, we have an investment plan for 2021 till 2025 of about 3.2 uh, billion euro. Why the previous the plan for 2020 2023 was about 2.3 billion so a difference of 1 billion just with the difference of one year and mostly all the investment this billion in addition is dedicated for offshore and interconnected don't forget on the other hand that the system and I'm talking about the electric, electricity system on its turn, will be put more and more under stress. Indeed, due to the fact that uh, more renewable renewables are connected, in fact, to the grid via uh, power electronics, uh, with, in fact, reduced inertia, what do you have to to understand with reduced inertia is with a lower amount of rotating machines that are really powerful in the system as a result. Uh, this in fact, for the TSOs, we will have to find uh, new or additional resources to guarantee the stability of the system. So it's not just a question of investment in the system, but it's also guarantee the good functioning of the system. And the need to increase, for example, resilience and adapt the approach to reliability behind, beyond, sorry, the, 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 the common N minus one uh, criteria is now more and more recognized and also processed by the different TSOs in Europe in the way and the methods used by them to develop, maintain, and also operate uh, the grid. The same is true also in the need to find how to optimize the integration of novel solution within the grid. And not only adding this new technology, but also the interaction between the classical technology and the new ones. A typical example for that is the DC links that you see that are more and more invested in Germany, but also in Belgium, and that are really integrated in an AC meshed grid two different kinds of technology with a lot of interaction between them. It's also a new challenge uh, where the different, uh, let's say, TSO will have to deal with. Lastly, maybe the existing, uh, what we are calling today everywhere, digitalization. And for me, it's more the use of more intelligence or automatization. And this related to the power grid, will be enhanced in the future and will help us also to manage more decentralized system with a higher share of uh, intermittent uh, renewable. In the same way, I think also access to digital technologies at consumer level will enable also the delivery um, of, of energy services to optimize the energy use, but also to maximize the value of investment, but now I'm talking about in a level of distribution uh, grids. And this brings me in fact to the importance of a well calibrated uh, regulation allowing uh, shareholders to satisfy the expectation uh, on return on investment 
and also the importance of right, and I'm really emphasizing on that, the right incentives to be sure to deliver an adequate future uh, power system. And because this transition will involve huge, huge, really huge investment. And at the end, if we are really honest, it's always the consumer who will, uh, will pay the bill. I believe it's almost of almost importance to make everything very, very cost efficient. This regulation and incentive I was talking about need to align long-term objective with what short-term, in fact, political and regulatory, let's call them cycles. And this is really a challenge for me. Um, so this regulation and this incentive system should support not, not only cost efficiency, but also what I will call the risk taking and innovation and enable system operator to use innovative uh, solutions and this to deliver the social gain on a shorter term. Again, an example for that. Uh, in the winter uh, 2014, 2015, we experienced here in Belgium a very, very tough situation uh, from an adequacy level for the winter. And we saw that. So we, we, we were searching for solution. And we find one part of the solution in a new technology for us New technology, I mean, with that, not really implemented at large scale in our network, namely the dynamic uh, line rating. And by installing uh, this kind of equipment on very important line, uh, know that we increased, in fact, for the winter, the import capacity of Belgium during the winter by, on average, 20, 25%, helping us to go through the winter without any additional uh, problems. And honestly, after, after this winter, we saw also very quickly uh, and in a reactive way, our regulator, um, how, how we say, really highly facilitating the further process to implement this kind of technology further in the network. Uh, innovation is also for me, uh, completely different of research and development. Innovation is more a concept like continuous improvement that we have to do on a daily basis on each uh, TSO uh, company in Europe. Now regarding research and development, then I'm looking more on the long term and how to help the development in that way of completely new kind of technologies. Uh, we need, of course, a regulative framework adapted to that, uh, that should allow us also uh, to realize pilot project by testing and demonstrating new solution that will be needed for the long term, and that will help us to, to tackle, let's say in that way also, to tackle the, the, the challenge of the next decade. For this, probably, I think it would be more intelligent to work at a European level with project at a European uh, scale also. Maybe as conclusion and as a final remark, uh, let me say that at ARIA, but I think I can speak in the name of all the TSOs in Europe, we are really open to engage uh, in a constructive dialogue uh, with regulator decision makers, uh, stakeholders, et cetera, in order to develop um, the next evolution uh, uh, in the regulative framework. Uh, and this for different time horizon, as I said, short term, but also long term. That will allow us at the end to deliver uh, the future system and grid uh, to benefit society and, uh, and, and consumer. So thank you. Great, Marcus, thank you so much for those comments. Um, I was furiously taking notes as you were writing because I really, really liked everything that you were saying. I particularly liked how you were referring to and versus or, meaning this is to be an approach that requires many solutions, not just one magic solution, that we have to take a very broad view of this. One question I have for you is, is that when I think about TSOs, they're 
their primary responsibility is to power our lives. And the world is becoming more digital, as Suzanne mentioned. Um, but now TSOs have to save the world as well. Um, and that's a, it's a huge order. Um, my, my question is, are, are TSOs organized properly? Because you mentioned innovation as being about continuous improvement. And I agree. You mentioned research and development being more long-term and taking a long-term view. And I wonder, and maybe this is, this is your role, but I wonder within TSOs, who ultimately should be responsible for bringing these technologies that are mature, as Suzanne said, are, are on the shelf and implementing them? Because personally, I, I do tend to see exactly what you said, that divide between innovation and, and research and development. And is, I think it can be difficult to identify who is that one uh, chief executive who's responsible for bringing these technologies to, to the forefront. Um, so thoughts, I, I mean, is there another role that's needed? Um, are we organized properly? Honestly, I don't believe that you will have one CEO who will be responsible to, to bring this technology. It's, the, it's really a shared responsibility. Uh, but you need enablers, you need facilitators. So everyone has to play his role. And in this context, for example, as a TSO, we are ready to do and to take some risk but we don't want to taking this risk to, 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 to have all the penalties possible behind taking this risk at the level of the company. Also, this kind of risk should be shared, should be discussed with regulator on one hand. On the other hand, as a TSO, we see also the challenge ahead of us. So I believe the TSOs must be more uh, in the driving seat, when we are discussing with big companies like Siemens, ABB, and other ones, in, in, in the mind of in which direction, in which area, they should really accelerate or emphasize the research and development uh, in really on technological level. For me, a typical example of that, everyone is talking about uh, high-level DC grid. But for me, uh, this will come one day. And it's probably very depending on when we are ready to have on a commercial level, not only on a prototype level, uh, DC breaker, for example. This is a, a very important element to have this kind of development. So as a TSO, when we are planning the development of networks, onshore, but also offshore, I believe we have to play more uh, to take a more leading role in this kind of future development and technologies that we will have to, to go through. And maybe a last word, because your first thought was, do you believe that TSOs are doing their job properly? I believe we are part, part of the cake and I believe we are trying to do our best. Uh, until now, from my perspective, and of course I'm working, so I, I, I probably, I don't have an objective meaning about that, but when you're looking back uh, as from the 20, uh, 2000, year 2000, and you're looking where we are now, honestly, the liberalization, opening the market, market mechanism, uh, all the, the, the spots uh, on energy that you have on, in Europe, the TSOs were behind all these new kind of initiatives. So I think we are trying quite a lot could we do it better? For sure. But if everyone was looking in the same direction and trying to do his best, then I believe that we could reach these very ambitious goals that was, uh, were put for, for what by, by, by Europe. Wonderful. Well said, Marcus. Thank you. We'll, we'll return to you. And I'm sure um, our, our panelists and our audience have questions for you as well. So um, we'll, we'll be sharing those. So thank you very much. And now, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Nathan Appleman, um, who is a market market design specialist. So Mark, uh, market Nathan has been with NSOE uh, since 2019, and he advises on market flexibility, including offshore wind, um, which make, I think, his comments today particularly important because really Nathan is at the nexus of electricity markets, regulation, and, and innovation. He is the co-author of NSOE's April paper discussing the need for 
the evolution of remuneration frameworks to meet the new objectives and challenges posed by the EU Green Deal. So very much topical. Um, if you haven't read that paper, I would encourage you to do it. It's, it's a wonderful um, read, and I'm sure um, Nathan will be making some comments on that here. Um, so Nathan, thank you, and uh, take it away. Thanks a lot, Alex, for uh, the great introduction, and thanks to Current for hosting today's excellent discussion, uh, which, as Marcus uh, very correctly pointed out, comes at a pivotal moment. Uh, we're looking uh, at the next 10 and uh, 30 years, and, and very important decisions need to be taken, uh, and for which we need a collaborative approach to towards finding uh, solutions. And so today I'll be presenting, uh, introducing to you some of the key messages uh, from uh, the position paper from ENSOE that was published in April of this year, uh, highlighting the need for remuneration frameworks uh, for TSOs to evolve. And even though the, pub the paper was only published in the spring this year, the thinking behind it obviously is the result of uh, long-standing discussions, which have particularly accelerated since the publication of the EU Green Deal which uh, places the grid and especially the transmission grids at the really at the center of the energy transition. And as such, TSOs are the enablers or will be the enablers of massive changes in our systems, ranging uh, as Marcus al al already highlighted from integrating onshore renewables, uh, developing the offshore grids, deep electrification, digitization of the sector and cross-sectoral uh, integration to name a few. And of course, all, all of these deep changes are even further stressed uh, by the recent publication of the Fit for 55 package. These also pose a dual challenge, which I would like to say a few words on today. Um, firstly, and uh, Susanna has always also highlighted this, this poses the need for significant uh, investment efforts in the next decades. Uh, Suzanne mentioned a number of upwards of uh, 500 billions uh, by 2030. And this needs to be balanced against the need uh, to keep tariff increases sustainable for the end consumer to make these deep transformations acceptable to regulators, policymakers, and to the public. And the issue that TSOs face today is that with low risk-free weights to which is bound the uh, capital remuneration for transmission uh, investments, this can eventually endanger TSO's ability to carry out these investments. And therefore, a fair remuneration for TSOs for their capital intensive investment programs is needed. And these huge investment programs will only be sustainable if TSOs can raise sufficient ca uh, cash flows and can get uh, debt at a fair rate. And furthermore, regula regulatory frameworks should also ensure that uh, projects with shorter uh, depreciation periods, uh, such as is the case for many innovative solutions, are also encouraged. And the second challenge uh, in complement to this is the need for the massive deployment on an uh, unprecedented scale of uh, innovative solutions. And this is needed to both unlock the potential of the energy transition and of course, also to stay on course with the decarbonization targets, uh, particularly in view of uh, well, the lead times necessary to uh, build new transmission lines. And in that re respect, TSOs are expected to carry out a whole series of tasks, uh, many of which do not involve uh, heavy capital investments, and therefore today do not generate remuneration for TSOs. And for those, uh, taking this into account, TSOs must be encouraged to take risks and perform to the best extent possible for the interest of the consumer community. And to do this, financial incentives are needed to provide meaningful rewards, but also penalties to motivate TSOs to step into this role. Uh, at the same time, we should recognize that incentives are a powerful tool and which should be implemented gradually, uh, taking into account several things such as the maturity of the regulation in the, uh, in the country, um, and obviously to ensure sufficient alignment with the long-term vision uh, of regulators and policymakers. And to do this, I would highlight uh, 
perhaps four key solutions that we mentioned in our paper. Um, uh, first, uh, we would like to see a clear regulatory framework based on meaningful and carefully designed incentives. And in our paper, we highlight several incentive design criteria, which we see are key for uh, the, up the well, ongoing and upcoming discussions, which will be needed for updating TSO's regulatory frameworks. Uh, secondly, TSO see a need uh, for lower bounds or a floor, if you will, of uh, risk-free weights, which determine the, either the WAC uh, or return on equity of TSOs. And these are needed to limit the lowering remuneration, which we've observed over the last decades, and which will otherwise jeopardize the ability of TSOs to build up equity and carry out uh, the necessary investments needed. Um, the third uh, solution is the need to move towards a TOTEX approach. And I believe some of the colleagues present here today will also touch on this. Um, this is already being tested in certain electricity TSOs, uh, but, uh, such as uh, Tenet Netherlands in Germany, also uh, National Grid. Uh, but also here, I think we can learn from other utility sectors, such as uh, water and uh, public transport. And uh, here, well, I mentioned the example of uh, Tenet Netherlands in Germany, uh, which have implemented some years ago a project called Fix OPEX and CAPEX uh, Shared Joint Projects. And to put it simply, all costs are regarded as total expenditure, and therefore, uh, and based on this, a fixed share of these costs is added to the regulatory asset base, such that it ensures that a bias towards CAPEX heavy investments uh, is minimized and all, all costs uh, thereby are treated the same. And finally, the, last, the fourth and last solution I would like to highlight today is uh, particularly with regards to encouraging more or more risk-taking behavior on behalf of TSOs, uh, in innovative projects, but also in R&D projects. Uh, we believe WAC adders for certain well-defined and very high priority projects uh, will uh, definitely drive future investments in, in these solutions, be it uh, DLR, FACTS, uh, HVDC, in which already many TSOs are involved today. So that's it for me. And again, I encourage you to uh, go through the paper and look forward to uh, your questions. Great, excellent, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I'm just taking a, a ton of notes here. All, all excellent um, points that you that you're raising. You know, perhaps this is more of a philosophical question, but I, I think about you suggesting that we take more risk-taking behavior with with innovation. Um, and yet, you you also mentioned that there are these technologies that can um, dynamic line ratings as, as an as an example that can help achieve greater capacity gains and reduce congestion um, prior to or in concert with with building new transmission which is certainly needed as, as well should we be perceiving that as as a risk um, so if we if we recognize that in some instances there will be the need for new transmission yet that might take 10 years is implementing something like load flow control or dynamic line ratings should that be perceived as a risk, or, or is that should that be seen as a um, a necessary step on the path toward uh, toward a, a transmission system build out? I'm just wondering if we're categorizing this properly. Well, here, maybe I well, I would like to go back actually to the very interesting point that you raised uh, with uh, Marcus a few moments ago concerning the distinction between R and D and uh, innovation. And for r and I think, well, uh, I strongly believe that TSO should be encouraged to fail. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a really, I think, a core principle of uh, looking forward uh, 15, 20, or 30 years. And uh, this is something that, of course, uh, ref contains huge risks uh, and which is currently not rewarded. Um, when it comes to more m or uh, technologies with a more uh, higher technology uh, readiness level. Uh, here, there's uh, well, a range of incentives which can help better reflect uh, not only the value to uh, society, uh, but, al but also, also also reflect some of the risks 
in those investments. And uh, here, we, uh, of course, it's a discussion between well, how do you, how can you quantify some of the benefits, and how can you incentivize TSOs to choose the most appropriate uh, investments? But of course, risk is present in every type of investment, even uh, traditional uh, transmission lines, and simply needs to be better reflected uh, to incentivize TSOs to act together also with other stakeholders to uh, deploy these solutions as quickly and as cost efficiently as possible. I think it's an excellent point. I, I think that, you know, to a certain extent, TSOs risk is, is, is a tricky topic to deal with when, with, from a TSO perspective. I mean, the responsibility that TSOs have is, is so vast um, that risk is to be isolated and, and mitigated. Um, but from an economic perspective, risk should be adopted. It's those two things don't always go together philosophically, but, but it's an important point, I think. Excellent. Great. Nathan, we'll be coming back to you um, with a lot of questions. So thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn it over uh, to, to Michael Berger, who is responsible for expert network development at eControl and is co-chair of the Acer Infrastructure Efficiency Expert Group. And really what I think is important is Michael has very strong engineering background as, as well. Uh, and it's very easy for people like me to, to want more efficient utilization of the existing network, but it's actually people like Michael, who of course not only want that, but have the actual engineering expertise to, to know how to make that actually happen. So it's great to have somebody with, with that background um, um, giving us comments here. So Michael, thank you, and I'll turn it over to you. Um, yes, good morning and welcome to the webinar also from my side. My name is Michael Berger and I'm coordinating the ESA Infrastructure Efficiency Expert Group uh, together with Jan Kostils from ESA. It's a pleasure to speak here today. Firstly, I would like to start with the CR paper that was developed last year triggered at the Copenhagen Infrastructure Forum uh, 2019 as a result of the EC Commission's equity study on the support of innovation and security of supply in European electricity and the other infrastructure. The ECRI study recommended a series of regulatory measures to be implemented by individual NRAs. For the pre preparation of the Copenhagen Infrastructure Forum 2020, CR conducted a questionnaire to assess the status of this implementation of uh, uh, the recommended uh, measures. The findings showed that some measures were already included, while others were not easy to be implemented, were currently assessed, or were planned to be implemented in upcoming regulatory updates. Another finding of the questionnaire was that there is no formal and harmonized understanding of innovation throughout the NRAs. But most NRAs share a common understanding that innovation is correlated with development um, that increase grid efficiency and benefits for network users at the same or even lower cost. The conducted service weather showed that innovation in electricity transmission is mostly promoted indirectly via the general regulatory framework and or um, specific features for network performance. In addition, specific actions for innovation have been or are being uh, adopted in several countries. And we will hear some applications for specific measures from the Italian regulatory uh, framework later uh, in this webinar. Lastly, um, the survey showed that about half of the NRAs consider specific measures for innovation appropriate, while the other half seems that general regulatory framework already provides sufficient stimulus to developing innovative solutions. Next slide, please. Um, ASA and the regulators are working on a couple of other issues related to innovation regarding electricity infrastructure. I'm going to highlight some of the most recent positions. For the revision of the 10E regulation, ASA and CR published a position paper stating various high-level principles for the 10E process. For example, we see that the current governance of the 10E scenario development process potentially leads to promote aspires and, appro and approval and amendment powers would be needed. As well, we address the fact that uh, non-transmission infrastructure like storage or innovative projects are assessed by the ENSOs. Even if such projects might compete with transmission projects and there's no evidence of the ENSOs competence to assess such projects. Also our position paper advocates for joint onshore offshore network development under the umbrella of the existing QNDP process. At the, to 
complication of the network development process for offshore network development could potentially lead to inconsistencies in terms of scenario development and assessment methodologies. When it comes to Article 13 of the 10E regulation, risk-related incentives, we see a considerable risk of in, uh, inefficient over-remuneration for certain PCI projects. Since 2013, only one project in electricity transmission was granted that incentive. And even the EC commissioned trinomic study conclude, concluded to not include the risk-based incentives uh, in the current form of the re revision of the regulation. When it comes to cost-benefit analysis, Acer has repeatedly addressed various improvements like the monetization of benefits, like uh, system flexibility, usage of um, AC flow-based network studies and the transparent calculation and visualization of the main project assessment indicators, the net present value and the cost-to-benefit uh, cost ratio for all projects. Additionally, an improved CBA methodology could highlight the benefits and the potential uh, faster implementation of innovative solutions compared to traditional investments. The electricity directive also defines the duty for regulators to assess and monitor uh, the performance of CSOs and CSOs in relation to smart grids that promote energy efficiency and the integration of renewables in a limited set of indicators. NRA has to issue a biannual report and address recommendations to the network operators. Next slide, please. Um, CR also issued a paper on CSO related procurement of flexibility, where different categories of promoting flexibility of CSOs, um, access to flexibility were discussed. Besides a rule based approach via network codes and an approach via connection agreements on national or individual level, uh, and an approach via network tariffs that include flexibility supply options for network users, market based procurement of flexibility was investigated. The paper describes three, four preconditions for market-based procure, procurement of flexibility. Balanced incentives in terms of the balanced CAPEX OPEX remuneration to DSOs. Ensure adequate neutrality in terms of legal, informational, and functional unbundling from affiliated companies. Technical prerequisites pre in terms of sufficient level of observability and controllability of the network and the framework or regulatory guidelines to foster free competition and adequate liquidity through ensuring full information, rational access, standardized products and low cost. Um, yeah. Another task for DSOs and the regulators from the electricity directive is the implementation of network development plans for distribution system operators including transparency on the needed medium and long-term uh, flexibility service and the planned investments for the next five or 10 years to come. From next year on, DSOs with more than 100,000 connected customers will have to consult, publish, and submit those plans to their NRAs. CR is currently drafting a paper on high-level princip principles for distribution network development plans to be published later this year. Also, ASA and CAR have established an expert group dealing with infrastructure efficiency. There were two surveys conducted, one addressing the TSO community and another one addressing the NRA. The results are currently being evaluated and with, uh, will potentially be presented, um, uh, and some conclusions will potentially be um, presented at the upcoming Copenhagen Forum. Thank you. Great, Michael, thank you very much. It, it's, it's very encouraging to to hear everything that's that's going on and, and certainly the level of attention on these topics is is, is high um, you mentioned that innovation is understood as being correlated with cost effective management and i'll draw on your engineering experience a, a bit here um, we have things like technology maturity or technology readiness scores which ideally tell us when an innovation is no longer an innovation. It's ready for, for wide-scale deployment. Um, but sometimes those types of scores can still be a little bit abstract. And I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective, at, at what point should we no longer be considering technologies innovative and, and start to see them as integral to the solution that, that, you're, that you're discussing here? Um, meaning at what point should these technologies be 
adopted at, at a broader scale as opposed to just being tried out with, uh, you know, with that mindset of, hey, it's, it's innovative. Mm. Well, um, I, I might refer to the example Markus uh, Berger brought to us of uh, dynamic line rating in Belgium. And uh, I, I, I may refer to, to the Austrian experience where um, actually internal lines, most of the internal lines already experienced um, those, those, this upgrade. And, 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 and for, for, for from, this, um, from this experience, we saw a lot of um, quite good success. Um, and, and, and therefore, uh, I, well, our, our um, experience is quite, quite good with this kind of technology. Um, and, and also the, the readiness of this technology is quite, quite, quite good, yeah. Hmm. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I'm so far. I'm, and maybe the audience is as well starting to identify a, a bit of a trend um, from from all of our speakers so far, that this notion of innovation um, as a concept perhaps is is more ready to be thought of as as something to be implemented, um, and perhaps adopting a more of a, of a higher risk tolerance, um, but also recognizing the the incremental gains that can be delivered by these technologies in the, in the near term and not necessarily seeing this never um, never ending horizon of innovation we can we can actually start to implement um, many of these things which is which is great michael thank you we'll we'll certainly return with with questions and now i'll turn it over to uh, ricardo Bellotti, who is an officer with the italian regulatory authority for energy networks and environment He's also the co-convener of the ACER Electricity Infrastructure TF and chair of the European Council on Energy Regulators um, Electricity Infrastructure of WS. So Ricardo, we're thrilled to have you here. Thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to you. And thank you very much for the invitation. Well, uh, as you mentioned, they have several activities at European level under the umbrella of uh, is NCR discussing regulation in different countries, but this was also briefly presented by Michael before. So uh, today I will be focusing on Italy and speaking about uh, some, uh, some experiences uh, uh, which I believe for two purposes. Uh, the first one, I think it was already mentioned by uh, by Marcus Berger at the beginning, uh, you need to stimulate uh, some innovation, uh, some pilot project, uh, being aware that it may take a decade to go to real life implementation, or even it's uh, sometimes research, uh, the result of the research will be do not go ahead with this technology. Um, the second part of the discussion is on uh, some output-based regulation we put in place. But let me start from the pilot projects. And I go back to 2012. So the, the guess of 10 years, a decade to, to implement is more or less confirmed. Um, the regulator introduced uh, a pilot project for TSO-owned storage and included uh, um, a minimum requirement that uh, dynamic, lane, uh, dynamic line rating application should have been uh, included and tested and publicly disseminated. The details of the um, regulatory scheme, uh, it was uh, an increase of the uh, weighted average cost of capital, meaning an increase of the return for the cost of the storage and uh, uh, DLR technology. Uh, but it was conditional. It, co it was conditional to some actual outputs in terms of uh, um, re reducing the curtailments of renewables. Uh, there were different tests, and some of them achieved the target, some not. But the interesting result, rather than the, let's say the, the rewards for the TSO, is the impact uh, uh, at societal level. The cost. Uh, of investment for the geometry rating was below one, uh, one million euro. And the actual benefit uh, after one year, we already the double. And by the way, this is the double valued at the price, which well, today is quite different across Europe because it was at the time valued at uh, 
40, 40 euro per megawatt hour, while current price is so much higher. So um, that was our, uh, the main result of our experience with the pilot projects uh, on um, dynamic line rating. But it, it took till 2017, uh, small uh, in the line at the bottom, there is a date, which is 2017, which was uh, the time needed for uh, the regulator to put in place the framework for the TSO to uh, uh, embrace the challenge, uh, to put in place the projects, uh, to, to, to run the projects. So it always takes time. To, to go with new technologies. Um, if I can ask uh, the, the colleagues to please move to the next slide, uh, I would move now to uh, the concept of how to base the regulation. It was already mentioned before by, uh, for instance, by Miguel, that uh, uh, some regulators, more or less half of them, and, and it was already mentioned also the Belgian case, uh, the, the regulator supporting uh, new development from the TSO. Uh, looking at uh, some outputs, some something useful for society to be promoted, which has a side effect, has the, a positive effect as well as in new innovation. Uh, since 2015, the, the Italian regulator has started introducing additional, meaning additional to the historical, let's call it, regulation promoting quality of supply and reliability of supply. Um, and this output-based investment intend to promote uh, all investments under a technology-neutral approach uh, according to their expected benefits. Uh, the concept is in the end to give a small part of the, of the benefit of uh, network investments to, 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 the, uh, to the TSO, uh, leaving the majority of the benefit to all other network users. Uh, the benefits are those uh, I saw before a discussion in the chat regarding the, uh, the possibility to account for benefits. And here uh, uh, there is a list from Italy, it's actually not complete, but it's most of uh, the benefits we are considering increase of socioeconomic welfare, integration of renewables, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, and reduction of non greenhouse gas emissions, reduction of energy not supplied. A reduction of costs for uh, dispatching and balancing services, and uh, reduction of uh, costs for mass transit units. Um, so uh, this second message is focusing on the value for the entire society, the value from networks. And my last slide uh, will be about uh, uh, the other, let's say, the other coin, which is traditionally considered by by regulators, uh, uh, which is the costs uh, and the investments. Uh, I would say that, uh, that the situation mentioned before for Belgium with the transmission plan increasing, uh, let's say by 30% or 40% from two to three, even 50 maybe, uh, from two to three billion euro uh, is well similar across Europe. There is a significant increase of investments. Also in Italy, in the, uh, the, the last proposal of transmission plan moves from uh, 14 billion euro over a 10 year period to 18 billion euro. And that's why it becomes important uh, um, for, uh, for regulators, but I would say for all of us to, 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 to keep an eye on the uh, network related part of the energy bill. Our energy prices are already well, drastically increasing, especially in this period. And that's why it continues to be important for regulators to stimulate also um, efficient costs. Um, uh, for that, uh, the regulator introduced a specific in incentive for uh, uh, costs uh, lower than the standard capital expenditure. Uh, to build the new capacity. Uh, actually, this uh, um, instrument to favor uh, efficiency and potentially alternative uh, technology and solution complemented the previous uh, regulatory mechanism, which already targeted uh, the increase of cross-zonal transfer capacities. Both instruments 
are in the form of, uh, of a reward, meaning a premium for the TSO. And the, this premium is based on uh, partly on historical congestion revenues and partly on the expected benefits. On top of uh, this basic premium, this basic reward, there is the possibility with the cost efficiency uh, complementary measure to up to double the, the, the reward for the TSO if the capex uh, uh, of uh, new technology will be very low. In theory, with a zero cost capex, the TSO will be able to duplicate its reward from the scheme introduced in 2018. But uh, apart from technicalities of the, of the regulatory framework, which is, well, as a regulator, sometimes we fall a bit in love with those, but uh, the important thing is to look at the, at the actual implementation. And currently, we are looking at uh, the first preliminary impacts. The TSO uh, published the, the indication that uh, four internal consumer capacity across Italy were uh, improved by January, since uh, January, early this year, January 2021, um, by using the, a combination of means, uh, which uh, includes dynamic line rating, special protection schemes, uh, and other uh, low uh, capex intensity network measures. Uh, the total amount of these capacity increases is uh, 1.6 uh, uh, gigawatt. And uh, currently, the NRA scrutinizing on the on the measures and on the impact on the capacity is ongoing. So um, that's our. These are some examples. Uh, the, I limited myself to these few examples, but uh, recently there was a new consultation document published in July uh, to uh, further stimulate the reduction in um, balancing and ancillary services in general, which is another part of the uh, actions of the regulator to facilitate uh, uh, improvement in the uh, transmission network development. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Great, Ricardo. Thank you so much. Uh, a lot of uh, really important content there. On, on your one slide back, you had listed numerous benefits and and the, having the requirement that some of those benefits be served for a project to move forward. What what struck me was that there can be instances where those benefits don't always align. For for example. Um, a reduction in cost may not always reduce greenhouse gas emissions in, in the short term um, or societal benefits that we need to factor in relative to um, economic considerations. So <clears throat> what's your perspective on, on situations where there are multiple benefits that, that might run the risk of, of sometimes canceling each other out? Um, is it is it a hindrance to have all of those benefits considered um, since since not all of them can be achieved? Well, for sure, uh, a, 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 that's a very important comment. There are some effects that could be potentially negative, and to some extent, even come to uh, write off each other. Um, in Italy, since two thousand and sixteen, we put in place uh, we put in place some minimum requirements for the transmission development plans uh, requiring the monetization of 10 benefit categories. Uh, when uh, There is a lot of debate on the complexity of uh, monetizing everything, but uh, when having uh, the, the, the money as, as a metric, it's easy to take into account maybe that some projects could have a negative impact in terms of losses, of network losses. And consequently, or independently from that, it could have a negative impact in terms of greenhouse gas emissions because it uh, facilitates, uh, it deploys more um, pollutant technologies. At the same time, it, it, this needs to be balanced with other positive effects, maybe uh, exploiting more renewables and uh, increasing trade across regions. Uh, uh, we took this approach of uh, a complete monetization, or let's say, a nearly complete monetization by uh, quantifying and monetizing 10 benefit categories. 
and uh, the, uh, after that it is uh, there may be critics on the robustness of the monetization but uh, when everything is money then you can you go into the details and you can check again or, or variate one parameter and so on but uh, this is the approach we use in italy uh, and it was immediately of course followed by the by the tso after the regulator story yeah it, it's a challenging situation I, I think that's well said um sometimes it feels like as a regulator, you're probably put in a very difficult position where, where people want it all. They want carbon neutrality, but they also want cost containment. And these things are difficult. And as, as regulators, I'm sure you feel, feel that challenge, but ultimately, of course, decisions need to be made. Um, and ultimately, perhaps it's the efficiency of the system that needs to be prioritized. Um, and, and all of those other things hopefully would fall into place, but it doesn't mean that there won't be uh, short-term, short-term pain. Um, great. Well, we'll certainly. Uh, but if you allow me, if you allow me, actually, that we have another um, recent activity, which is a total cost approach. And we started applying it for a couple of uh, parts of Italy where there are large investments, large infrastructure investments. So we currently we are complementing the cost benefit, the project by project cost benefit analysis, with the. Uh, uh, system, we, do, we did it for two insular systems, total cost approach, look, looking in the, let's say, the 20 year ahead horizon, uh, what would, could be the, 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 the least cost solution from uh, an overall perspective. But uh, sorry for interrupting about that. It's, it's a current challenge in our, in our work. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, as, as we turn to industry representatives uh, from Wind Europe and, um, and from, from Enpassaman, you know, we start to think about what things like grid enhancing technologies can deliver. And studies have shown that really at 5% at of the unit cost of, of building new transmission, you can have a, a much greater level of sophistication around understanding um, transmission infrastructure and, and that can lead to significant gains, but taking that total cost approach um, and perhaps reassessing <clears throat> cost benefit, um, I think is important. I mean, much of what we're hearing from all of the speakers is that perhaps at the core is an economic discussion around how grid enhancing technologies advance while also maintaining the same level of um, of, of precision of, of the system, but also the cost effectiveness for, for the customers, um, because certainly that's, that's a huge consideration as well. Um, great, so let's do that. Let's, let's now turn to uh, representatives from, from the industry. We've, we've heard from TSOs, we've heard from regulators. Uh, the third leg of the stool, so to speak, is industry. And uh, we have uh, with us Vasiliki Klinari, um, who is a senior analyst, analyst at, at Wind Europe. Uh, for system integration and digitalization. Um, Vasiliki coordinates Wind Europe's activities on, on wind power system integration, including grid codes, grid planning and optimization, interoperability, ancillary services, digitalization, and, and cybersecurity. So that's a mouthful, a whole lot of, of really important things when we start to thinking, thinking about incorporating um, more wind. So um, let's, let's hear from Vasiliki. Thank you very much, Alex, for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me here. So I wanted to, to give our perspective and explain why also for, our, for the wind sector is so import, important to enable a wide deployment of grid optimization or enhancing technologies. Uh, of course, in parallel with uh, an accelerated uh, grid uh, build out. So, uh, it was already commented by, by Marcus at the beginning and Nathan that the power grid is today and will remain the backbone of the energy system and the best platform to build upon for accelerating the European decarbonization target. To make this happen, investment will need to step up from 40 billion annually today to uh, 66 to 80 on average annually from today to 2050. So, the, we're talking about a volume of uh, investment and a pace of investment that is extraordinary. And, and uh, investment decision would be a big challenge for the society and, and for uh, the countries, of course, individually. 
and it is very important that these investments will uh, will uh, uh, will remain at high value will the, the value will remain high in the long term from a social welfare point of view of course and from a sustainability point of view and at the same time uh, they need to be uh, to 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 make sure they will be bankable it's very important that the assets uh, will uh, be as more efficient or as more uh, optimized as possible so this is one reason why we see uh, a major role in uh, in the deployment of wide deployment of from a sparse pilot deployment today uh, to a wide deployment of uh, grid optimization technologies in the future, both for existing assets and for future um, uh, grid assets. So next sli slide, please. I wanted also to, to present another point that is not often uh, brought to the surface when we talk about grid investments and how much uh, they impact um, the how much how big impact they can have in enable uh, in enabling investments in renewable generation assets. So the market value of uh, variable renewables is also variable and it heavily depends on uh, on um, the, the grid uh, capacity. Uh, and and on the right grid capacity and how efficient it is. So in this uh, graph, you can see is, is an example from the United States, from Texas, but there are similar examples from uh, from Europe. You can see that the market value of wind after two thousand seven um, was declined very quickly, and a major factor was was the increasing uh, curtailment. While after around two thousand eleven, uh, it this trend was completely uh, reversed and the major reason was the introduction of uh, new transmission lines so for the wind sector uh, ensuring that uh, the asset wind assets will be as more optimized as possible is uh, is important for two reasons first to ensure that the, the renewables will be able to connect that the assets will be there so that we can connect but also to make sure that Investments in renewable assets will be bankable uh, in the long term. Next slide, please. For these reasons, we two years ago we started a new work stream at Wind Europe, uh, our task force on grid optimization. Uh, it was a group of experts from our members the, representing the whole wind supply chain, so wind turbine manufacturers, wind farm developers, and operators and of course, grid uh, technology providers. And we, as a first step, we created a library of what we call as grid optimization technologies. We came up with five categories, the one you can see on the slide here. I know that ENSOE recently published a very advanced platform uh, presenting these technologies, the Technopedia. Nathan, I think you didn't mention this. Um, and, uh, and um, as a second step, we, we engaged with uh, five TSOs uh, leading in terms of uh, innovation projects. A Alia was one of them, for example. And we discussed with them uh, deployment projects they have deployed of uh, these grid optimization technologies, the benefits they saw from this, and what they see as uh, major uh, barriers to their wide deployment today. Next slide, please. Based on this exchange that has been very, very useful, we, we, uh, we developed a position paper, a white paper, a Europe white paper, where uh, we, we developed some recommendations on how we believe that the uh, uh, regulatory framework for TSO investments should change uh, to enable a wide deployment of these technologies. Uh, I will maybe focus on the first one because uh, it's, it is made the most important or, or maybe the most important first step for us. Uh, so we believe that an adequate remuneration framework for TSO investments should uh, remunerate these investments for their total expenditure efficiency and not separately uh, for their capital value and their operational uh, expenditure efficiency. So one system view also from, uh, from the finance perspective and I think uh, already well, I mean, an example was mentioned by Ricardo before, or also in the position paper uh, that Nathan presented, uh, there is an example from Tenet, the FOC uh, uh, project. And we see as one way to do this, uh, we think that the CBA's uh, CBA analysis methodologies should be uh, revisited, and we should 
try to factor in these criteria that are not today factored. Uh, some of them are, are mentioned also in uh, Ensoe's paper, like uh, sustainability, efficient contribution to decarbonization targets. For physical assets, maybe the risk of non-delivery of time, uh, or for innovative solutions, the risk of non-delivery of expected benefits, uh, or contribution to the lifespan uh, of assets. Uh, grid optimization projects can also be asset-based ones, not capital intensive as traditional uh, transmission lines, but they may even increase operational expenses, but contribute to other very important factors like the one I mentioned, I mentioned now. And uh, for example, the recommendation uh, in Enso's paper to enlarge the regulatory asset base uh, could be a very good start for, uh, for visiting this uh, CDA uh, analysis method. Another point that I don't have here on the slide is that, of course, updating the regulatory framework will be resourceful. It will take time, it will require uh, human resources. Um, so we think to, to justify this at the European level, a very good driver would be to deploy some studies, uh, wide area studies, European level, regional level, to quantify the benefits of, uh, of deploying grid optimization technologies. I know there are some national examples today, uh, but I think this, this would be a very good um, driver for now. Thank you very much and uh, happy to take any questions. Great. Thanks very much, Vasiliki. And <clears throat> I, I really like the, um, the slide that you showed with the grid optimization or the grid enhancing technologies. You know, I, I put that in context of, of the comment, though, that Ricardo made um, about the time it takes. To, to study these and um, in, in his opinion, that can, that can be a decade. I think you listed 19 grid enhancing technologies. How would you recommend that, that all of us implement that? Um, you have multiple technologies that can serve a more electri electrified future, uh, more, uh, more digital um, carbon neutral path, but with, with all of these available technologies, how should we go about thinking about adopting these, um, given the time frame that Ricardo mentioned uh, of, of implementation? I think, first of all, that, uh, that, that and knowledge sharing will be very important. So create, creating something like a, a toolbox with uh, such technologies that could be considered uh, when, when looking into potential investments would be a very good start. And of course, a very, very important is what I mentioned about diversifying the criteria that uh, should be considered when, uh, when evaluating new investments and creating some benchmarks. So based on already deployed projects, uh, but this goes back again, of course, to the knowledge uh, sharing points. Hmm. It's interesting, um, you know, I, I think, Many of my colleagues would agree that when when we have our respective grid enhancing technology that we're offering to the market, sometimes it seems as though each TSO or, or each utility needs to gain experience with it individually, as opposed to having a more collective dialogue um, across all TSOs to say, you know, hey, Elia has has vetted this and, and this works. Therefore, we don't need to have it take the same path with every other TSO, almost a process where we're able to stand on each other's shoulders and in advance as opposed to each each TSO um, independently testing this technology. Maybe that's a topic for another day, but but something to to consider. That's Licky, thank you. Excellent comments. And now um, with just a little bit of time. Please, Alex. Can I can I just add to what uh, Vasiliki just said? So indeed, uh, thanks for highlighting the Technopedia Vasiliki, uh, I, uh, which indeed is a great resource for uh, knowledge sharing between TSOs, uh, by the stakeholders, and of course with the with the public. I would also, on top of that, highlight the fact that it's also embedded in uh, Ensui's RDI roadmap, which offers a plan for the next ten years. Uh, in terms of aligning TSO's vision for the future, especially with regards to deploying innovative solutions and uh, seeing how they will be integrated in the, in the future systems. I would also encourage everyone to, to check this out. Uh, there's a public webinar on the website and 
material you can uh, definitely check out. Sorry, Alex. Per I'll no, it's a perfect example, Nathan. We're, we're advancing the dialogue here, here and now. That's perfect. Thanks. Um, great. And now I'll turn it over to my friend, Rina Kuwahata, who is um, really, she has two jobs. Uh, so she is the co-chair and uh, board member at, at Current, which um, frankly is a full-time job alone, but she also leads business development at Impassamon. And Rena has more than 15 years of experience in power grids uh, through working both with uh, utilities and advisory companies. So Rena, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'll try to be quick. <laughs> so thank you very much to the previous speakers for the wonderful insights. I hear a lot of alignment on the opinions and that's great. And so now I'm very glad to share um, what we observe as non-experts of regulation, huh? <laughs> what we see as an outcome of the existing regulatory regimes. And so first of all, we see the same things as the previous speakers yeah, in terms of the industry trends. Uh, there's relatively new requirement to release this 70% of cross-border capacity for day ahead and intraday power exchange. This is an important regulatory piece for us. This is a, um, and as this, um, as a result, this regulation as a result uh, is, it, it, anticipated to cause congestions, not only on cross-border um, components, but inside a country as well. And um, there's also ambitious targets to integrate more and more renewables quickly, over 500 gigawatts uh, more than today by 2030. Um, and this indicates that grids will only be more congested uh, despite the reinforcement and the build-up plans. And the cost to get rid of these congestions will remain high. And on top of this, there is uh, the NIMBY, right? The not in my backyard problem, um, which delays the realization of these major build out plans. And uh, there will be not, not only rising congestions, but also rising pressure to reduce the congestion management costs as well. That's what we expect. And um, we need to be on top of all of this you know, to achieve the carbon neutrality goals by 2050. So we see plenty of reasons for the deployment of grid enhancing technologies like the ones listed here, you know, dynamic line rating, power flow control devices, superconducting transmission, and intelligent sensors that give more visibility. But as technology providers, we feel that the uptake of these solutions could be faster, and uh, society would also benefit from a much faster deployment of the technologies. So our question is, what is preventing this fast uptake, and how can we speed it up? Next slide, please. Um, so as members of current, uh, as I said, we're no experts on regulation, but we have some humble observations that uh, in different regulatory regimes that we um, have observed, it spurs relatively fast adoption of technologies. And that's what we list here. I'd like to share some of them. Um, first, we consider Belgium to be a great example. That's why we have uh, Mr. Marcus Berger here as a keynote speaker as well. Um, they have uh, experienced this fast and wide scale adoption of dynamic line rating and power flow control devices. And this was spurred on by output-based incentives by the regulator. Um, a portion of the value generated by the increase of the import and export uh, capacity can be claimed by the TSO and this has become a, a, a huge uh, trigger for uh, speed of adoption. And so um, this is one of the main reasons probably why also now and in European Union, the regulation demands 70% cross-border capacity to be available for the market trade, because uh, this kind of um, incentive then uh, for, for increasing the, the cross-border exchange, uh, power exchange, this uh, will deliver um, market efficiency gains. And if you can capitalize from that, then it's benefit for everybody. Um, in the United States, uh, we've seen similar incentives, but applied in a nodal pricing market. Uh, this removes, uh, by removing congestions and facilitating access to cheap energy, that means that the TSO can also monetize a small portion of this benefit. So that's also been a, a good stimulus for adoption of uh, grid enhancing technologies in the US. In Australia, uh, we see uh, there's regulation to explicitly separate out investment in small scale projects as opposed to the traditional huge uh, million dollar <laughs> investment in transmission. And this has been effective to implement grid enhancing technologies very quickly. Uh, in Germany, uh, we've seen just this year, some changes. It was mentioned by Susanne at the beginning. Finally, we introduced an incentive instrument to reduce congestion management costs of TSOs. Also, Redispatch 2.0 is taking effect as of next month. And we have very high expectations there that further steps will come in Germany. In the Netherlands and Belgium, the NIMBY, you know, the not in my backyard sentiment is quite strong. 
And uh, this me means that the governments have put in uh, legal restrictions on the type of new grid build out. And this has acted as a strong incentive or disincentive or kind of to, to um, well, disincentive for investment for, for CapEx pro uh, expensive CapEx projects, right? And it's acted as an incentive to look for alternative solutions that are cheaper than underground cables to deliver the needed grid capacity. And uh, in France here, the new wind farm connections uh, cannot be refused. This is a new, uh, relatively new legal requirement. And this then acts as a kind of a penalty. Sorry, it's not uh, the, the curtailment penalty, but um, there's a penalty that applies for not connecting the wind farms if they have uh, applied for connection. So broadly speaking, we see both the carrot type incentive on the left side and uh, the stick type incentives on the right side as both being very effective in getting TSOs to move. Um, and our conclusion, so, is that both types work. Regulation is good, yeah? <laughs> but what we see as most effective um, is regulation that aligns the TSO behavior with public interest. And where parts of the benefit is shared between the TSO and society. And so generating social welfare alone it's not really acting as a motivation for TSOs to move, but um, the business case has to be clear for the TSOs. How, how will they gain return on their investment in these grid enhancing technologies? And um, the, the, the lack of the clear monetization pathway makes it challenging for them to establish a credible CBA. So this can be seen as a bit of a blocking point that could be helpful with more clear regulation. Um, so yeah, we think that more explicit rules on this will help TSOs assess their business case and will spur faster adoption. So that's um, what I wanted to share. We have two minutes left. <laughs> ah, thanks, Rena. You bring up really, again, we, we started with perhaps more philosophy or any with some philosophy. How do we define CBA? And, and, and there, there's a lot that could be considered. Um, Nathan, um, I, I know that you had, had a question both for, uh, for Rena and, and for Ricardo, um, so if you'd like to uh, to ask, please. Thanks, Alex. Um, <clears throat> so uh, maybe my first question, and this is also relevant uh, for Rina's uh, comments just now, is when we talk about innovative solutions, we're not just talking about capacity enhancing. Uh, there are many benefits, uh, actually Wind Europe's paper uh, highlights uh, several of these benefits, and there, there are even more, and many of which cannot be uh, adequately monetized. Uh, Rina, you touched uh, you touched on this already. Uh, I mean, one uh, obvious example that comes to mind is, for instance, uh, technologies that uh, enhance security for uh, uh, transmission line engineers to avoid uh, further injuries or or worse. How how do you quantify that? And CBA, CBA projects are already uh, being applied by many TSOs for certain more mature and larger uh, solutions. At the same time, these can be a rather resource intensive exercise for uh, smaller projects. Uh, so this may be uh, uh, me open, opening up for, for discussion and reactions also. How do you uh, foresee that uh, looking both at the regulators but also the voice of industry here? Uh, maybe I could say something. <laughs> um, I completely agree that grid, grid capacity or capacity enhancing technologies is not the only uh, thing about innovation. Um, um, nevertheless, uh, specifically to that topic, um, which is the one that I'm most experienced in, there we do see, um, you know, our technology being deployed. And there is clearly a, a business case behind it. There's a reason why the TSOs adopt these technologies. So um, the know-how is there. There are already established ways to monetize it or business cases behind it. I think uh, perhaps that knowledge is not um, common knowledge to a lot of people. <laughs> and so, yeah, knowledge sharing would definitely help a lot. Um, and then maybe from there we can find commonalities and, and start to develop standards or methods that should be, you know, a guideline methodology or something like this. So that's why I, I also put in the chat, maybe a workshop would be a good way to start uh, such an initiative. But yeah, perhaps there are already things like that going on inside NSOE. No, this, they certainly are. Uh, sorry, and I'll, I'll let maybe Ricardo or Michael uh, speak in just a second. I, there, a, a, 
quite wide range of questions we're asking ourselves and several TSOs have already taken initiatives to understand if and how a CBA can be applied to certain uh, technologies taking also into consideration certain questions like how how relevant is a CBA when uh, those investment those very investments which are targeted are already imposed by either European or uh, national regulation or also well, even though that's perhaps more relevant for R&D project but it's still uh, still very much uh, a, a relevant question for in a, uh, uh, more mature question uh, technologies is also how do you take into into account the risk of failure uh, which is perhaps lower but still uh, these are questions that uh, of course we're asking ourselves and uh, I think this workshop is the a perfect way to trigger further discussion on on these. Uh, sorry, I'll maybe, let Ricardo uh, take over. Maybe before before Ricardo gives the answer. In addition to what you you were saying, Nathan, when I was listening to to all the discussion that uh, that you have and the different panelists, you are talking. I'm not sure that you always talked about the same things. When you are talking about CBA, DB, the benefits. What's behind it? It's completely different, uh, Reina, than what you are talking about public interest. So from my perspective, it should be very important to, if you organize a workshop, I'm, I'm sure that will help to clarify things, but I believe also you should be sure that everyone is talking about the same things because we are, we are here discussing the TSO should this should do this, the CSO should do that. We are part of, let's say, a value chain. And the understanding of what's happening and the challenge that we have is the first and the most important thing. I believe also, Rina, that uh, that at low cost, when I'm regarding the big investment that we have to realize at low cost, monitoring, for example, power flows with uh, technology like uh, dynamic line rating can help and improve the way we are managing the system uh, uh, really in a huge way avoiding other type of investment. On the other hand, to be honest, if we wanted to reach the goals that are put forward by Europe, we need to make and to realize this heavy and the big investment also in the network. So how to manage all these different constraints, it's, it's a challenge uh, already uh, just for that. But if you are discussing CBA, if you are discussing how to put in place incentives from a regulatory point of view, be sure that you're talking about the same thing. I believe this is quite important because otherwise you will turn around and turn around and the chicken egg uh, question will be raising again. Uh, along the same lines, maybe I would say that uh, we have to keep in mind that there are benefits beyond capacity, like for security and uh, just to mention, uh, apart from that, Reability, classical reliability recently during the, I think it was in May, our TSO consulted also on a methodology to try to quantify, monetize potentially the impacts of extreme weather events, which is very difficult because it's very rare. So, but the, the other benefit which could be confused is the benefit which is at the level not of deployment of project, but the, at the level of the pilot project. At that stage, it is important to take into account the replicability, the possibilities for the solution to deploy over time. And maybe at that stage, it is less important because that benefit of deploying innovation is so difficult to quantify. At that stage, uh, sometimes you do not really need to go too much into the discussion of benefits, but simply there to, to push the pilot project and see if it delivers uh, uh, or not. But I really agree that uh, it's important to clarify what is meant by benefit because there will be many understandings under this term. And, uh, uh, it, it, and it is indeed complex as well. It's a good point, Ricardo. And building off of Marcus's point as well, the notion of a benefit um, needs to be considered carefully because Ricardo, you mentioned proof of concept or, or pilot projects. And in my experience, those projects tend to be focused on whether or not the technology works as opposed to evaluating the overall benefit, which is, is perhaps more of an academic exercise as well, not just a, a technological um, exercise. So 
I think understanding where these grid enhancing technologies fit in and what that broader economic and societal benefit can be um, requires us to, to accept that these technologies have been tested, have been proven. And that's where it's, it's my job, it's, it's Darina's job, it's Vasiliki's job, it's Suzanne's job to step in and say, look, our experience across the industry has been that this is working. And now these technologies are available to, to all TSOs. So, um, you know, I, I think that's an important discussion to continue. And really that's what we're doing here. This is, this is knowledge sharing. And um, uh, this is exactly where these types of things happen. And, and that's a credit to all of you uh, from TSOs, from regulation, from industry coming together to have this discussion, to move us all forward. So I want to thank first our, our speakers, Marcus, uh, Suzanne, Nathan, Michael, Ricardo, Vasiliki, Rina. Excellent job. Thank you so much for making the time. And a special thanks to our audience. As, as I said, this is where the conversation happens to advance us. But it's not just the people who speak. It's the people who listen, I think, that perhaps get the greatest benefit out of it because we then all turn around and, and share this with our peers. And that's what allows us to grow. So thanks very much to, to the audience uh, for, for being here and making the time. I will put in one, uh, one commercial. So um, coming up on October 27th from 2 to 3.30 uh, Central Europe time is the Infrastructure Forum. Um, and this group uh, current will um, be at a policy conference for um, achieving climate neutrality through grid enhancing technologies. Sounds very similar to, to what we've been talking about here. So it'll be an extension of this conversation that will be hosted by, by us, by Current, also NSOE, Wind Europe, and the Copenhagen School of Energy Infrastructure. So we look forward to um, that, that very interactive dialogue as well. So with that, thank you again all. Um, have a great rest of the day. We look forward to continuing this dialogue both on email and, and in person with these uh, continued current webinars. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.